Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. We're going to have a bunch of those Christmas videos from Tuba Santa, led by our own music in Missoula's Gary Gillette. So we'll have a lot more of that going into our show. We got a brand new uh, uh, um, <laughs> dubbing stuff. We got new city council. Basically, a lot of things at the 11th hour of all like government just before the New Year strike. So I'm here for you guys this morning as it is December 23rd, uh, 2022. And next time you'll see me, it'll be the new year. Um, so I'm going to be off for the next two weeks. So I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about some of the more recent news that happened this week. The, and of course, you know, at the very beginning, I saw President Zelensky kissing Congress's butts for more weapons against the Russians. This was part of the $1.7 trillion spending package, which down to the last hour passed just before Christmas. This included the uh, $40 uh, billion on top of all the other uh, uh, relief that we've given the uh, um, Ukrainian people. Part of the package was Vladimir Zelensky's uh, visit to America, where he spoke not only to Congress in English, but he pitched this whole we the people in securing their national security and fight for democracy. So far, Ukraine is um, constantly dealing with the shelling from Russian forces, even more so uh, on this particular visit. This has been an interesting week, and the weather shifted to the point that most of America noticed. And of course, winter storm warning, uh, if you haven't already noticed this week, and you know, that is, uh, I worked at KPAX, and every other week was a winter storm warning, so just kind of bear with me. And if you've been, in, uh, hey, if you're in a place like Missoula or anywhere in Montana, you, you know, you know, you, know, you look, out, look outside, it's like, okay, this is pretty bad. So part of this is the winter storm warning for Tuesday, Wednesday kind of happened this week. Uh, Thursday was kind of like, uh, uh, kind of like the end of it as we were trying to get out of the cold. It was probably the coldest day, uh, definitely of the year, but it wasn't going to be as cold as everyone thought it was going to be. And so particularly, uh, uh, it got, it, they said it was going to be below like negative 45. Yeah, maybe in Eastern Montana, but here in the inversion that we live in, in the city of Missoula, we maybe got negative 15 at most. But with wind chill, we might have gotten up anywhere upwards between 25 and, um, yeah. yeah, like I, I would say like at, at most negative 25. And that might just be at the airport here in Missoula, which always tends to be a little bit colder than most places in the city of Missoula. And that's where a lot of times uh, uh, the weather is being uh, monitored from. So anyways, uh, let's see. Uh, a a Montana-born and Great Falls native dropped by the Wilma Theater the other night to perform. Reggie Watts was in town for his annual visit to Montana on his way home for Christmas. Probably the only show I uh, tend to go to and pay those uh, exorbitant prices between anywhere between 30 and $40 just for the uh, general admission. So, <coughs> those, 
it's pretty expensive. But uh, I don't know. I that's I usually don't go to many concerts, but it's definitely one of the ones I definitely go to. I definitely vouch for Reggie Watch. It's definitely pretty. Uh, it was definitely a great show. If you guys got a chance to see it, Mike Nugent eyes an electable run for uh, mayor of Missoula this summer. Uh, as we go into the new November cycle, they're going to be going to a new election. Uh, this is basically part of their kind of like the three prong election cycle. So uh, our old mayor John Ingen died um, through, um, uh, uh, from cancer. And then he was appointed, a uh, new mayor, Jordan Hess, was appointed through a city council vote. And then that was going to basically determine the next uh, session of voting, which would be uh, the, the November election, which will be added to the ballot, in which that will be pretty much finishing up the next uh, two years of John Ingen's. And this is the one that actually people get to vote for as well. So beyond the uh, back alley deal that saw the final decision of Jordan Hess taking over from uh, his Ward 1 seat, uh, Actually, no, it's War II. My bad. Uh, so, you know, not that it's too relevant, but Mike Nugent got voted in as city council member at the beginning of uh, this year and has since focused on many issues that the rest of the council believe in from housing to lack thereof. So this election cycle will award a mayorship for the Missoula for the remaining two years of John Ingen's time as mayor following by yet another election in the official uh, timeline of uh, 2026. Um, on the state level, legislation is going full DeSantis in their approach to restrict LBGTQ plus folks in schools and exposure to drag shows. I always thought that drag shows were 18 plus, but I guess, you know, they're just trying to prevent uh, what happened in Billings not so long ago. What happened in Billings is that there was a drag queen, got all dressed up and everything, and did a kids reading at one of their local libraries. And so as a result, Montana kind of overreacted and basically started to uh, the concept of banning certain groups of people. That's just kind of how it is. The last legislation banned trans athletes in sports in Montana with a, very, uh, with a blatant exit for funding. So if the, on the federal level, if they decide to be like, hey, you're basically restricting trans rights to basically play these sports, blah, 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 we'll take your funding away. And then this law, which is kind of a weak law in the first place, uh, would basically cut it under the rug. But I'm not going to get too much into it, but I want you guys to remember that this is actually something that uh, kind of really just kind of turned me around um, in terms of uh, the spectrum of sexuality and everything like that. And Neil deGrasse Tyson explained it very well on a uh, popular podcast that uh, just uh, came out a couple weeks ago. And this is his quote, we're just being lazy by assigning seven colors. Our brain doesn't want to see nuance because it's easier for us to think in binary. So it's, are you with me? Or are you against me? Well, maybe you're somewhere in between. Uh, are you a boy or a girl? Maybe there's expressing themselves uh, somewhere in between and your brain is difficult time recognizing a spectrum. And so you're requiring it to be put into a bin. So there you're focusing other other people to match how you see the world. And that is wrong. This was an interview with comedian Theo Vaughn on his podcast this past weekend. And it's very interesting. I really like that. So the Montana legislature will look into this along with the many other bills starting January 3rd with a very inflated budget of $1.5 billion in surplus for the state of Montana. So there's a lot of uh, things that possibly could be happening to uh, enrich uh, the people of Montana for these next legislation session, which happens biannually, which means it happens every two years. Um, Talking about bigger news that's happening around, you know, the saga of Twitter is kind of coming to a close in terms of Elon Musk uh, floated the idea of being like, hey, I'm going to let the people decide if I should remain in power. And uh, almost, you know, <laughs> almost like 57, 60 percent of the votes out of 13 million users basically voted down for Elon Musk to leave. Recently, Elon Musk has been a uh, teeter totter banning and unbanning folks for some things. And when he started to ban journalists, things got a little iffy for the freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Um, I don't want to say that Elon Musk tenure at Twitter was a disaster, but it was pretty much that. From being a guy who promoted free speech and bringing, uh, bringing a sink when he took over the company to symbolize everything and the kitchen sink joke from the 50s. Hey, it's the 50s. Uh, when it rains, it pours, and it saw many more folks getting banned, including some journalists who published Elon's private jet path. Uh, the biggest pull out was the some 90% of advertisers that saw this as an excuse to exit the social media giant and so far saw Tesla stock, another Musk company, lose billions after acquisition. Uh, you know, there's just a lot of uh, surplus to let Elon Musk kind of be like, hey, you know, you know, by thinking about leaving, t uh, Tesla stock actually went up. So it kind of seems like it's going to be uh, beneficial for his uh, other companies that he can control as well. So. Uh, at some point, hopefully, monopolies will be broken up someday. But there is also, uh, let's see, hmm, 
And Musk said he never wanted to be a CEO of any company, preferring to see himself as an engineer. And this move by the Twitterverse may see the mogul step down while remaining a majority owner of Twitter. So I'm not so sure about exactly what's happened recently, but he said that he might he will honor the uh, stepping down the, uh, of the uh, CEO. But uh, as so far, it's kind of like up in the air. So one of the big things that happened just this year as well is the FIFA World Cup just wrapped up. Argentina won against France in soccer. Uh, they did get a tie in their official bout, but the uh, Argentina had enough wins to result in their ma uh, major thing. So soccer is kind of weird like that since most sports have winners and losers, but soccer also have ties on top of which their effects are overall standing in the end. So it's usually cumulative wins, standings, and everything like that to determine you know, who wins. And so congrats, and we'll have the next men's soccer in three years, which is going to be hosted by North America and not just uh, uh, the USA, but also Canada and Mexico. So it's going to be a kind of like a tri-country uh, NAFTA kind of FIFA World uh, Cup as well, which will have a, 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 at least 32 teams. But um, regardless of the clear corruption, which basically the officials announced that, yeah, we took the money, we took the bribes from Qatar, and we got it here. Um, it was a way of, it was kind of like their laissez-faire attitude. And the next cup will be very interesting, and perhaps the U.S. will have a hometown advantage. Uh, women's uh, soccer will probably be great. Men's has always been kind of iffy, you know, as <laughs> most people have joked over the years. But who knows? We might get the uh, good galvanization of uh, men's soccer over the next three years. So we'll look forward to that for the next FIFA World Cup. Uh, speaking of... Uh, the pandemic. Uh, I just wanted you guys to know also as well is that uh, free tests are available from uh, covid.gov. You can get upwards of four tests for free and get it mailed to you. If you need it or simply want to stockpile it, then great. So uh, the covid tests are free. Uh, they originally uh, had them be like, okay, we're not going to do any more free covid tests. And then they saw uh, greater numbers of covid um, people getting infection, a lot of people getting sick. Heck, I even did a shoot not so long ago uh, from Sentinel High School that basically highlighted that oh, a lot of their choir members were out sick so you guys uh, will be able to see a lot of MCPS uh, concerts on MCAT sometime soon um, so yeah let's talk about other things um, everyone's talking about the January 6th panel which finally wrapped um, I, I looked up the numbers and they spent upwards of uh, three million dollars of taxpayers money on the investigation overall and and they basically determined that uh, Trump lit the fire that started the pandemic I mean start not that start sorry let me rephrase that but former president Donald Trump uh, basically lit the fire of the January 6th insurrection so that's basically what they uh, put down on there but like many of uh, the panels that Congress put down it's mostly just like here it is um, and yeah, we'll, they'll see how it turns out, which, you know, like everything else, it, nothing has ever come to fruition in the end. So anyways, um, I guess the one thing right now is that, you know, like money went to this particular thing, but also money can be used as a tool for uh, nuclear fusion. So uh, nuclear fusion was a big thing in this, just this past year was basically the holy grail of energy. And so part of this is basically using a giant heated laser hotter than the sun to combine molecules. And basically that reaction creates energy. And it basically almost uh, doubled the energy that, oh, actually it, basically 50% more energy was created than was uh, being used to pursue. So fission is what's otherwise known as splitting the atom, which you already know goes in terms of creating nuclear bombs. Uh, nuclear fission fusion produces far more energy and only small amounts of short-lived radioactive waste. Importantly, the process produces no greenhouse gas emissions, therefore does not contribute to climate change. And so that's one of the big things. It's the, they call it the holy grail of energy, and there's a lot going on for that. Um, and so they were able to crack the code, and once you crack the code, any, like everything beyond there is it just beyond but also wait hold on a second this just in grandma got run over by a reindeer and we have somebody with the story here is Gary Gillette Snow. 
when we found her Christmas morning at the scene of the attack. She had hoop boots on her forehead and incriminating cloths marked on her back. Ah! Grandma got run over by a reindeer walking home from our house Christmas Eve. You can say there's no such thing as Santa, but as for me and Scotty, we believe. Now we're all so proud of Grandpa. He's been taking this so well. See him there watching the football, drinking beer and playing cards with Cousin Bill. It's not Christmas without Grandma. All the family's dressed in black. And we just can't help but wonder, should we open up her gifts or send them back? Grandma got run over by a reindeer, coming home from our house Christmas Eve. You can say there's no such thing as Santa, but as for me and Grandpa, we believe. Now the goose is on the table, and the pudding made of fig, and the blue and silver candle that would have matched the hair in Grandma's wig. I've warned all my friends and neighbors, better watch out for yourself. They should never give a license to a man who drives a sleigh and plays with elves. Ah! Grandma got run over by a reindeer, walking home from our house Christmas Eve. You can say there's no such thing as Santa, but as for me and Grandpa, we believe. Actually, I probably should turn on my microphone. So, hey guys, welcome back. Uh, that, uh, I shot that uh, last video of Gary Gillette um, at the DraftWorks Brewery um, that happened last Saturday. So, let's get things off is that, you know, Puss in Boots is uh, doing The Last Wish. And my last wish would, not, would be not to see this film from the DreamWorks company that which would have failed if Shrek didn't become as popular as it was as before. Enjoy a movie about a cat, which frankly will get less eyes on this than random cat videos on your feed. Have Antonio Banderas reprise his role as the umpteenth time. Ump is the measure of a lot of characters in Puss in Boots in which they've done this a lot of times. But anyways, enjoy the character Puss in Boots as he prepares to prepare people to die because he is a parody of Inogo Montoya from The Princess Bride. This movie is about a cat in his last life because, you know, he, he, he lost nine of his lives and that's kind of like the joke of the movie. And so the power of a fallen star will give him this wish and then he can probably end up, you know, using his wish to save someone very important to him instead of saving himself. And then tears, tears, tears. Maybe it's the end, maybe it's just the beginning. Anyways, we only have one life. Moving on. Whitney Houston, I want to dance with somebody, and that somebody is addicted. Ooh. Enjoy a two and a half hour movie that reminds us that Beyonce wasn't always the Queen Bee, and yet another Oscar bait film buried in the holiday films that may get some legs like The Greatest Showman. Hey, people like Whitney Houston. Um, and you know, the you know, the greatest showman since movie type music type films always have their audience. And Whitney Houston doesn't get credit that she deserves, for sure. But I guess uh, deserve a film about her life t in two and a half hours. We just did Elvis, and we can expect her to, uh, <sighs> she got to think about her whole life before she goes up on stage. Basically kind of movie. And yeah, you get to enjoy a bunch of things like that. And probably have to deal with uh, Bobby Brown and all that stuff. So you get to hear all, uh, 
the glitz and glamour and all the warts and all. Uh, finally, we speaking of <laughs> uh, warts and all, uh, Babylon, enjoy an early look into early Hollywood full of wannabes and never was. Um, as they uh, have the good old times in Hollywood land, world of depravity and unchecked celebrities that even in today's standards are done with a little bit more restraint, we adults gotta go crazy before we can go sane and Hollywood is the perfect place to be something instead of somebody. Um, any, anyways, Margot Robbie's in this movie and she's like, hey, who's a pretty young blonde girl? Well, pff, Margot Robbie. Uh, is there anyone new? I was like, no. Uh, oh, what about uh, Jessica Lawrence? You mean Jennifer Lawrence? I was like, yeah, who cares? Anyways, that's always the Hollywood machine. Is like, oh, it's always the youngest, prettiest girl. And then she's like, I guess she can act. Who cares? Let's just look at her. But anyways, this movie kind of like goes to the uh, glitz and glamour. I just heard about like apparently there's like a, a a thing where they have like an elephant poop on a guy's face and they like literally shot a POV of it. Uh, I don't know. I I did not see it. I'm not going to see it. But uh, all I know is that it like it's by the same guy who made the uh, La La Land. So um, <laughs> I'm I'm sure cinematography is really good. But the everything else. Who knows? All right, so the next couple weeks, we're going to have a couple films just kind of drop and uh, disappear without a uh, trace. Um, we go to prison in this next movie called The Flood, but it's with alligators. Enjoy a series of horror tropes from people being pulled under the water, uh, and the jailbirds aren't as bad as the baddest bad guy, but there's a very bad guy with a heart of gold. Uh, it's like Con Air, but, but wetter, and maybe Florida. Uh, the guy from uh, Starship Troopers is in the film and uh, doing his thing. I mean, I could say his name, but uh, you know, people would only know him from, oh, the guy from Starship Troopers is in this. Okay, cool, whatever. Casper Dan Vian thing. All right, f next up, we got a Bloomhouse uh, film. Uh, Blumhouse, Bloomhouse, uh, and it's called Megan. And it's, you know, like when they do original horror films, it's good. I, I actually got to give them props. Even when they did the, the uh, remake of The Invigil Invisible Band, they did a good, good job. But enjoy like, yet another kind of futuristic, uh, you know, child play doll, you know, who becomes sentient and tries to kill it. But in this case, it's more just about how they're too good at their job protecting the little girl that they're bonded to. Um, so far, enjoy a creepy, realistic looking doll the size of an average 8 to 12 year old girl in a rampage destroying everything in her path. I'm going to see it because it looks like it could be a Black Mirror episode. Or I'm not going to see it because it's a Black Mirror episode. That's kind of how Black Mirror is. It's like, ah, let's go, let's watch the Black Mirror episode. It's like, okay, which one? Oh, the one about like social media? Nah, I'm good. But anyway, <laughs> finally we got women talking. The Mennonites, uh, you know, they live in their own uh, society in kind of like a Jane Austen kind of world. And this movie kind of talks about a, uh, uh, the whole idea of a Victorian age of repose and dignity. Uh, except the cult leader because, you know, he can get it. Uh, anyways, watch a bunch of Amish-looking uh, women trying to escape their hyper-religious cult through the power of their words. And I believe this is had to do with some real-life 2010 Mennonite colony where men can do whatever they want and blame Satan or, or women madness on their actions without punishment. Uh, there is a reason why confessionals are con confidential, so they can get forgiven and just go back to sinning. Anyways, uh, religious er, is wonderful. Religion is wonderful, ain't it? All right. <laughs> Moving on. Up next, we have a brand new dub and stuff from the 1934 version of Babes in Toyland. So when I come back, we're going to talk about some city council, and there's a lot to talk about. In a march, march here, in a march, march there. Here are the stockades. Hey, listen up, everyone. This lady here is going to jail. But first, she's going to the stockades. Can you believe that? Listen, there's no need to cry, young miss, for... This happens all the time. Oh, Anybody she's crying now. Let's get out of here, guys. Jail. Oh, and it's not really. Come on, move along. Oh, move along. You better Let's dry go. those eyes, young miss. For the people aren't necessarily leaving because they feel sorry for you. They're leaving because they feel uncomfortable from your crying. So please dry those tears. Oh, don't worry. They're just crocodile tears. Ha <laughs> ha! Marvelous, marvelous, darling. Now we can have some real alone time. Well, you know, in the public eye, but you know, it's like. You know, it's just, you know, just how it is. Okay, so here, let me help you with that. Ah, these tears are pretty convincing. Yes, they are, but I'll still never make them on Broadway, after all. I'm just a, a Oh, husband. nonsense, darling. You probably were a never was. But perhaps if we work together, okay. we can fool these people into thinking that you're some kind of big mm. person coming into town. Oh, really? You think you can do that? Well, you can call me a vaudevillian actor who never loses his trunk because I sure got your back. Mm, that's really convincing. So, first and foremost, what are some of your talents? Can you sing? Can you dance? 
um, is wanting to be famous enough? Well, not quite. You have to have quite a gimmick, kind of like Galker and his uh, watermelons. You can probably be something like mangoes or bananas or perhaps something that's a little more safe, like pretending to be somebody. All right, all right. I have to do my job too, you know. You gotta be in the stockades. But heck, I'll keep you company. Now, I don't want you leaving this spot until you think of a good act. Hmm. <laughs> Robin Hood looking. Hmm. 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 Would you like me to repeat that? I'm really bad at hearing. Well, it looks like I found my inn. Huh. Can't believe this was made in the 1930s. Let's pan away. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Kissy, kissy. Kiss. I want kisses. Well, that was my last dub and stuff for the uh, the year, and you guys will be able to see my compilation come out next Friday in the vein of my YouTube channel, so you guys can check out the full uh, series of dub and stuff. I made over 40 dub and stuff this, just this last year, um, well over 2 hours and 11 minutes of me dubbing over old movies clips. So yeah, enjoy that. Ooh, okay, let's move on to some city council. So we have a lot to talk about in terms of city council. You know, um, there's a lot of things happening as well. This was a two-hour meeting as they dive into various topics from municipal codes to your streets and an annexation and rezoning good good times had by all in this planning phase of the city uh, the uh, during the halt of winter um, this was a, a fun clip of a de there was a fun clip of a developer getting hot and bothered by the fact that he wasn't uh, told that there was an ugly sweater contest for their last meeting and that was pretty funny but I'm not going to show that <laughs> proclamation by uh, Mayor Jordan has talks about uh, folks lost to uh, being homeless, and uh, this was a uh, part of what MCAT was going to do, but it, the cold weather really made it hard for us to kind of find a venue for us to be able to record uh, the, uh, the Homeless Day Memorial, which happens at the end of the year every year. So here's Jordan Hess talking about the memorial. Whereas the winter poses extreme hardship for unsheltered and inadequately housed individuals, families, and children in Missoula, and whereas residents of Missoula will gather on the longest night of the year, December 21st, 2022, to honor and remember homeless individuals who have died in our community and environs. And whereas since 1990, December 21st has been designated National Homeless Persons Memorial Day by the National Coalition for the Homeless and the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council and is recognized by cities and states nationwide. And whereas in remembering those who have died without a house of their own, we keep urgently, we keep urgent the cause of ending homelessness, the need for compassionate response and the city and county's collective commitment to prevent such deaths in the future. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, Juanita Vero, Josh Slotnick, and Dave, David Strohmeyer, the Missoula County Board of Commissioners, and Jordan Hess, Mayor of the City of Missoula, do hereby recognize the 21st day of December 2022 as Homeless Persons Memorial Day. All right. And part of uh, uh, the reason why the emergency winter shelter was put into place is because of this memorial that kind of garnished a lot of uh, support towards the uh, inaction, uh, the, the action of uh, the emergency winter shelter. It's also important to note that before 2018, many folks were left on their own devices and had no place to go. And the added winter shelter made it easy for folks who were not able to go to the pub and use their services uh, for various reasons to get a warm, judgment-free place to go. Although never perfect, going beyond people, uh, meeting people halfway may be the only way to interview on their behalf. Um, you know, we originally were, MCAT was originally supposed to do it because, but because of the severe weather, which is kind of interesting that the severe weather happened just in time for the um, Homeless Awareness Day. So it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. But we're moving on to the uh, Missoula Municipal Code. It is on the chopping block to help streamline development in line with state law. This is a housekeeping, and unless they spend too much time talking about this, I will kind of leave it there. Eric Alstrom, um, Chief Admin uh, Operations Officer for the city, talks about these changes for this municipal code. Chapter 2.90 sets forth specific procedures for procuring architectural and engineering services. That's a um, particular kind of professional service. 
It was adopted in 1999, and as I understand, it was de designed to address concerns that were expressed by some local firms that, that were providing architectural and engineering services, that they were not uh, being selected for city, uh, city construction projects. Um, at the time, <coughs> some local professionals had expressed a concern that the city's procedures maybe placed too much weight on um, prior experience and uh, uh, performance in prior contracts with the city that were excluding our ability to work with local firms that had competitive bids. Okay, a big chunk of this uh, was kind of summed up uh, with the idea that, hey, so to correct this, they wanted to make it easier for other developers and contractors to make a bid and also being able to look at the bid and be like, hey, you know what, let's give these people a shot, you know, rather than playing favorites. This is kind of like the whole point of this. Um, and, you know, Missoula is growing faster than today in the last uh, five, ten years. All the bids have slim pickings and have, uh, and they want to expand this operation to get more projects going. Eric went into to say about the code 2.90 is easily changeable and this would not affect current bids for development. Uh, uh, Ross Mellenhauer with the presentation talks about the bidding process in response to concerns about getting going cheap every single time rather than uh, quality. Um, I think by state law you're not allowed to select engineers uh, by price or at least entirely by price and so we, ha we always have to just do an RFQ which is a request for qualifications so we're, we're picking them based on their qualifications but then the second part of what I think your question was are we looking at the financial stability of the firm is that what you were asking about? Um, yeah, that's that's my concern. Yeah, I, I don't believe that we really are like we might on a, on a with a contractor. Uh, we, we're generally paying the engineers um, each month uh, for services rendered, and so it's uh, we, we rarely get out ahead of we're not we're not paying out ahead of what what they've already provided us. Um, so I, I'm not, I don't know that we're getting a bond or, or checking their financial. Uh, numbers at all or anything like that we don't typically do that yeah i mean that's the whole idea is that, that you know they they pay for services and like hey they put a bid in and they're just that kind of thing it's you know there's you know more for qualifications and of course anything over eighty thousand dollars requires some form of qualifications the process is to create a wayfinding tool to help fit the contractors slash architects engineers with the right projects i mean i take a sidebar uh uh prefer if we stop hiring the architect who thinks the puke green um, is a good color for these modern buildings. You know, all, you know, joking aside, but anyways, uh, they, de they decided to repeal code 290 as it stands. And, you know, it's just one of those kind of like uh, housekeeping kind of things that they're working on as well. So streets, sidewalks, and public places is a result of paying for these resources, making it easier for council to interpret how much they kick in versus the development impact. Much like the back and forth the city went through the developer the previous Monday in which they spent six hours determining whether or not they should talk about um, spending upwards, uh, you know, if the developer should spend 100% for the roundabout or not. So. I don't want to get into it because we've already gotten into it. This is about Title 12 and Troy Monroe, Troy Monroe, city engineer, gives us a glimpse of basically what's under our streets. And just so everyone's aware, the city owns three utilities, a water utility, a sewer utility, and a stormwater utility. But there's, as you can see, there's a lot of other things in the street, underneath the street, that, um, that sometimes conflict with some of our utilities. And so we started looking at code when a new company called TDS Telecom, that you've probably heard in the news, it's a new fiber optic company that if you haven't heard of it yet, you probably will be soon, um, is, is looking to enter the Missoula market. And the attorneys have been working on a, a franchise agreement with TDS. And we looked at that language in that franchise agreement and realized there was a lot that could be made better in our own code. Um, so we started, you know, like I said, there's a lot of times when a someone's boring a new line underground and, and they might hit a sewer main or a sewer service. And we wanted to make sure that those those public or even the private uh, properties that are in there are protected. Okay, so you know, TDS is that new cable company that's moving into town and they want to uh, basically put some fiber lines in, in per with a contract with the city of Missoula. And this is just kind of like being like, oh, we probably should try to look at our own infrastructure, be like, okay, how are we going to do this? And for those of you who don't know what boring is besides the show, it is basically the drill that carries the additional line through the ground, thus avoiding open road installation. Um, you know, uh, and Troy Monroe also uh, talks about what you would see with these uh, boring installations. One of these asphalt cuts that we all probably have one that we drive across every day or bike across, and this is the one that I see every day. And this is where someone had to dig up our road that was in good condition to 
install a sewer service or a water service. And you can see it definitely leaves its impact. No matter what you do, it's going to leave an impact on the street. And so a long time before me, the city decided to start charging um, an asphalt penalty and it's more money if it's a newer street. Um, so, but the way we were charging that was we would do it after the project uh, was complete. And that was hard for us to collect on from the contractor. And it was also hard on the contractor to collect from his client or her client. So what we think is a much more effective way of doing this is just to charge it up front. Yeah, you know, you get your total cost all associated with what it's going to be and then your projected cost, you know, just to be on top of it. Um, let's see, where was I? So far, the city wants to be on top of any new projects that would disrupt the roads and flow of traffic along with what is left behind. If anything, this is just a housekeeping and making sure the TDS, for example, practices in good faith and the city is clear about what they want to do and what they want to avoid when installing their fiber and other uh, contractor sidewalk projects. In the end, the city will leave this open until January meeting after the holidays. Uh, another annexation is happening, and this is the New Mullen area neighborhood, and the way of Ward 2 is growing faster makes it seem like other wards will have to uh, remap pretty soon. Um, we do, Usually, back in the day, we've only had a remap maybe every five, ten years, and it, with these kind of uh, installations and annexations, of new housing and things in this area even you know this is not just the Mullen area but a bunch of other places as well that are growing like crazy and most of them have to do with affecting uh, as far as wards um, two and uh, wards uh, what is that ward four the lower Miller Creek area because they're getting a whole new neighborhood and everything like that but so anyways uh, this particular site uh, you're going to be, be able to see a map uh, Cassie Trippard uh, gave a, a kind of an example of what you may see in this new neighborhood and this is just kind of somewhat south um, upwards of uh, the Hellgate Elementary School off, off of the former Doherty Ranch Shown here is the subdivision preliminary plot. The subdivision proposes 260 lots, three smaller open space common areas, and a 27 or 26.72 acre open space covering two abutting parcels. The subdivision is bisected by England Boulevard and Doherty Drive. Camden Street is proposed to continue through the subdivision from the east. Five new additional roads are proposed as well, and lot sizes vary, but the average lot size is uh, 0.1 acres. So yeah, those are the kind of the size that you guys can expect from the uh, housing. You know, it's going to be pretty tight. You kind of like imagine those kind of areas of mixed use of the, um, you know, uh, expressway mixed in with some of the stuff that they already have near England Boulevard as you get closer to town. They have like closer buildings. Sure, they're going to have attached townhouses, but they're going to try to have a mixed use to have a more of a kind of a nice aesthetic kind of look. But one of the big things is they wanted to do is uh, on top of that, the Missoula area and the, uh, it, um, let's see, where was I? Um, I'm kind of all over the place today. Um, okay, on top of that, the Mullen area and the former Doherty farm, the higher density housing is planned for this area, but will probably match more of what you see in the neighboring areas. Cassie Trippard also talks about what can be expected from the city when in expecting its new housing in this particular area. So they're going to be, uh, you know, talking about all these, uh, let's see, um, like the rezoning and not just the annexation. So this is a, another big component on, you know, how they dictate how this area grows. So this is Cassie once again. T3 is a residential zoning district that allows mansion apartments, duplexes, townhouses, various types of detached houses, religious assemblies, group living, and daycares. Both the T4O and T4R zoning districts allow residential development between uh, 12 and 36 dwelling units per acre. The primary difference between the two districts is that T4O allows for commercial development. The T4R district is primarily residential, allowing apartments, duplexes, townhouses, and various types of detached houses. T4R also permits nursing homes, group and assisted living, religious assemblies, and daycares. The T4O district allows all housing types, small scale lodging, commercial uses, religious assemblies, daycares, and group and assisted living. Okay, so um, I kind of had to look this up real quick and um, uh, do, 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 for in terms of like, you know, mansion apartments, um, mansion flats initially appear to do. Oh, OK. So it's more just like, you know, like uh, bigger buildings and just kind of everything's kind of attached. It kind of looks like a giant long row of duplexes. So that's what they mean kind of like by a mansion apartment. So I can I saw that on a couple of their streets uh, just behind the uh, old uh, movie theater. And I think they kind of do that kind of mixed use as well. Um, <clears throat> 
So anyways, um, yeah, I mean, the city of Missoula, da, 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 the potential for high density and mixed use are high. And if you, uh, if you know the need for housing right now, stock will increase favorably in these areas. They will also have a designated farmland that will sit as agriculturally significant soils are present. That's what they mentioned in this presentation as well. And John uh, Dennert, uh, engineer with IMACOR, uh, some of the people with, in terms of working on this project and the future of this area, talks a little bit more about out their plans really by honing in on the physical form instead of just segregating the uses you get a vibrant livable community with a real sense of place and i definitely believe that that idea has been realized in the design for west end homes between the various housing options that are being proposed and the prioritization of open spaces throughout the development um, the huge potential for the open space uh, on the other side of England and the pedestrian connectivity throughout, this development is going to be a beautiful place to live for Missoulians. Okay. And so, you know, one of the big things is that they want to be able to have that kind of open conversation with the neighbors, the neighborhood, and of course, one of the big concerns, which is the uh, net gain of traffic and people going through this area. A lot of uh, this planning took a lot of stock uh, from the Missoula area project that had a lot of folks in the neighborhood adjust to the uh, new properties, give input and provide clear understanding of what kind of development folks can expect from these areas. They will talk again about this next meeting on January 9th. At the end of the meeting, uh, communications from the mayor had Jordan Hess put on a pretty risky attire uh, for the city of Missoula. And this is uh, from their, uh, this is uh, Mayor Jordan Hess. I also have an obligation to put on his hat for a moment. Uh, <laughs> In uh, mid-November, the mayor issued a challenge uh, on the record during a Bozeman City Commission meeting regarding the annual Can the Cats Food Drive Challenge. Um, so this is, uh, the deal was, as Mayor Anders put it, was that if Missoula lost the Can the Cats Challenge, she'd send me some bobcat apparel to wear in a public meeting. And conversely, if Bozeman lost the challenge, I'd get to do the same. Um, turns out we lost. <laughs> so while I'm dressed a little strangely or goofy for a public meeting, I want to highlight uh, what a little friendly competition can do for a good cause. Okay, so Can the Cats was a very important part in uh, bringing in food and um, things for the Missoula Food Bank and also many of the food banks uh, across, uh, across the state of Montana as well. It's been an annual thing. Bozeman's always won. Just so you guys know, it's like it's always kind of been a Bozeman uh, a singular thing for the longest time. So Missoula does tend to lose and, you know, food drive most years. And it was uh, more of a trap for a dear mayor. And that's basically it for this particular city council meeting. Up next, we have housing redevelopment and community programs. And so this one actually is kind of like a preemptive, uh, preemptive uh, designs to clean up some sites before constructions. And so part of this is the idea that, OK, Brownfield is uh, as a site in which money can get invested through federal dollars in terms and, and also in terms of uh, lending out loans to, organ uh, to businesses that want to build on former industrial sites that need some cleaning up to do. So Tyler Wallace with this new position that specializes in uh, brownfield programs uh, talks about this program. So this is what he had to say. We're here to protect human health and the environment by facilitating the redevelopment or reuse of properties throughout the city of Missoula, which may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance, pollutant, or contamination. Uh, the program makes funding available for local nonprofits and private developers to apply for a grant or loan to finance environmental assessment and cleanup. All right, so a big chunk of this had to do with the idea that um, nonprofits can get grants for these sites that need removal of toxins, and developers can get a loan to help clean up these sites. Part of this money would be going into a circular motion in which they want to try to figure out a way to help clean up a lot of these sites before initially uh, construction. This comes out of the heels of the north side neighborhood development in the industrial commercial rezone of the, into the residential, you know, the Scott Street um, um, neighborhood that they're going to be building, which is part of the Missoula Community Trust, which, you know, the city of Missoula has the land, so they're doing a community trust 
established in which the city of Missoula owns the land, well, the people only have to pay for their property, and once their property is fully paid off, then they basically would um, inherit the land uh, in purview of what the city of Missoula has done. So Tyler Wall also mentioned that the grants have gone on to help places like the food bank in terms of cleaning up their site as well. So he talks about this and many other sites as well. The slide that you see in front of you is just uh, four examples of community impact that we've made in, in the program starting up here in the upper left-hand corner, Masula Food Bank. In 2016, we provided a subgrant, which is used to clean up contaminated soil, enabling the construction of the new food bank. Uh, the Pavarello Center in 2013 was the, uh, benefited from a subgrant which was used to clean up hazardous building materials prior to that building being constructed. Um, so very success there. Uh, and then 2017, we issued a small subgrant to Garden City Harvest, our local food um, experts uh, and, and uh, gardeners uh, at, at the River Road neighborhood farm. Uh, which was used to clean up hazardous building materials of an old uh, an old building there prior um, for them to be able to redevelop that site. Okay, so the whole purpose of this is redevelopment, and you know redevelopment is a big thing in the city of Missoula as well as we're trying to uh, kind of uh, um, grow from the old uh, and build to the new kind of deal. So the Brownfield program will be on the. Uh, uh, will be the go-to for folks from various uh, for, for profits and nonprofit degree, but ultimately facilitate cleanup on the site. So we will have a $1.8 million budget to be revolved by 2028 as a means to loan and award grants based on current projections. So this was informational only, and you can watch the entire presentation online as well. But we're going to talk about some parks in view of the climate uh, conservation and parks or raising rates yet again. So every year the master fee gets raised, and which means that you're the use of parks, the use of Splash Montana currents and everything, those rates are going to go up as well. One of the big changes is that they're going to start paying uh, members and staff members, lifeguards, basically they're going to be jumping up from a, about $13, $25 an hour to about $18 an hour for these seasonal positions to help uh, facilitate your kids' safety and your safety during the Splash Montana uh, um, currents, you know, swimming pool kind of things during the summer. And, you know, I knew, you know, and, you know, I knew somebody who was a lifeguard and many were not really interested in doing this job because of the terrible people. <laughs> And this might appeal to uh, young CPR certified individuals meant to save drowning folks' lives. You know, swim teams at Splash Brown Tana will could spend anywhere between 106 an hour, about a $10 increase from last year. Um, they also permitting requirements for operating and running uh, drones in parks. So one of the big things is that, you know, hey, everybody's getting a drone. DJI is a big company. That's just one of the many companies that has drones. And they want to be able to be like, hey, you know what, if you're going to have this kind of a, a technology, we want to start regulating a little bit more so they're going to put some uh, requirements and have some permits in regards you can't just buy a drone and just fly it whenever you gotta now they're going to be a little bit more harsh on people to be like hey you need a permit or at least you need permission from the uh, 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 folks as well so anyways they also go into detail about the holiday and seasonal passes and so forth you know it's going to be interesting especially if the Missoula moves forward and buying uh, Marshall Mountain which is going to be a ski resort so think about the seasonal workers with the lifeguards there then you got to think about all the workers and people who are going to be helping people with the uh, snow slopes of Marshall Mountain. Uh, yeah, so it's going to be interesting how uh, the parks are going to be um, kind of spreading their resources throughout this next couple of years and just raising some of those rates are going to help grease the wheel to help um, encourage more uh, staff and workers to actually work within the parks and rec department as well. So anyways, this is what they discussed in detail for parks and I'm not going to bring up clips and I'm just going to jump into a chipmunk Christmas song for Tuba Santas. And I think this is pretty much it. There's really not much to say in terms of events. And I, I just wanted to wish you guys a uh, happy holidays and just enjoy Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever, Ramadan, whatever uh, religion you wish to uh, pursue and wish to be a part of. You know, you know, it, it, this is a kind of a time of belonging and being uh, cooped up in a cold place and be like, hey, you really can't go out. So let's just, you know, make up a tradition that kind of uh, gets people together and stay warm during the holidays as well. So here is, uh, uh, and for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. Have a happy holidays and take care.